everybody. My name is Scott Davis. I'm from the Greater Baltimore Church and uh, want to welcome you who are here in the auditorium, also those that are online, and you are here for our class entitled Marvelous, the things we learn from superheroes, I think, right? And so you want to know what I know about superheroes, I think, and uh, everything. Uh, more than someone my age should know, that's for sure. Uh, I know way too much uh, about superheroes, and we're going to talk about them in just a little bit, as well as, as well as what it means to really be a superhero in the eyes of God this morning. Uh, and, you know, look, I, initially when they asked me to do this class, I was thinking, what in the world do you want me to do talking to teens? I'm an old man. Uh, I know they want acrobatics, pyrotechnics, and, and somersaults. And I, which I can do none of. I'm too old for that. My knees won't bend like that anymore. Uh, and, and the second thing is that you guys aren't that shallow. You really want deep Bible study. It is exactly what we're going to be looking at and talking about this morning. Uh, but I did want to ask you guys before we got started, and uh, I'll get Eugene. Actually, I'm going to get Jared to help me out real quick. Jared, if you help me out and go to the sound booth and grab the microphone there. And uh, if I could have a few people tell me uh, who their favorite superhero is and why. Who's your favorite superhero and why? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, got somebody right there. There he is. Is he scratching his head? Nope, there he is. Yep. Favorite superhero and why? No? Maybe not. Okay. Somebody else? Anybody? There we go. favorite is Captain America because it's not like he has the greatest uh, strength and the greatest superpower, but um, he is pretty determined and he's a good person and yeah, he's, he's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, he's pretty cool, determined, good person. I like all that. It's good stuff. Yes. Give us your name too. Where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Daniel. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. My favorite superhero is Batman because he is rich. Because he's rich. We all want to be billionaires who, who fight crime. That's our, our life story. Let's get a couple more. My name is Layla. I'm from Seattle. And my favorite superhero would be Wanda because she is one of the most powerful super beings in the multiverse. And she's a little crazy, though. I'm just saying. Yeah, no, I like Wanda, too. Yep. Uh, my name's Timothy. I'm from, um, from Florida. And, uh, t yeah, Tampa. And my favorite superhero is Iron Man because he went from being, like, uh, greedy and selfish mm. to being all, like, I'll say this, um, not selfish. He, he cares for, like, the world instead of, like, himself. <laughs> and he's also a billionaire. That doesn't hurt either, y you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. I got you. I got you. We'll take one more, we'll take one more in the back. Um, my favorite is Superman because... <laughs> Because he's invincible. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Just helping you out there. All right. So here's the thing. I got uh, some gifts for us for three people. And so we got three questions about superheroes. We'll see what you know here. And I happen to write a book on prayer. That's a little bit about what the class is about today. And so uh, my first question is this. What is the name of Thor's hammer? What's the name of Thor's hammer? I'll take you right here. Right in front. It's hard to pronounce. Do the best you can. Can't remember? Okay, that's all right. All right, you in the front as well, in the green right here? You, yep. Milner. Milner, that's right, correct. You got it. This is yours. All right. Um, all right, here's the next one. What is Captain America's shield made out of? What is Captain America's shield made of? We'll take you right there, young lady. Yep, right there. Say again. Vibranium? Yep. Eugene, can you give me the turn? All right, last one. What is Captain Marvel's real name? The female version. Because there's several versions of Captain. We'll take somebody in the back, very last row. Yes. You right there. Carol Danvers, you got it. You guys know your superheroes. 
Now, but I guess you don't know this one. I'll give you guys $10 if you can guess it. I'll give that to you to give that young man in the back. The very back right there. All right, so what is the comic book number that Morbius first appeared in? Morbius. No. I actually own this one. Used to. There's no way you know this answer to this. Go ahead. No, that's not right. One more. Spider-Man, number 100. Spider-Man, number 100. Don't ask me why I own that comic book. I own so many. Uh, I've sold them all now for missions, as you do as you get older. Uh, but uh, that's the nerd in me. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned from superheroes this morning. And there's a few things that we can learn. And I'll tell you my favorite superhero. I'm going to tell you who it is later on uh, in our lesson today. Uh, but there's a couple things that we need to know. One, every hero has an origin story. Every single one has an origin story, a beginning where all their motivation drive, desire to fight crime, do good, be righteous, and be totally awesome comes from. That's what we know about heroes. Peter Parker lost his Uncle Ben. Batman, tired of crime and complacency and injustice in Gotham, decides to do something about it. Superman is inspired by great parents, both in Krypton uh, and on Earth, right? And see, so all these heroes were roused to do some good with the good they've been given. And you... You in this room have an origin story too, and that's very important. You in this room have an origin story too. All the potential heroes in Christ have an origin story. And the thing to remember is you can't rise above the origin or the motivation you've been given. So once you've been given a motivation, you can't rise above that. If your motivation is just to do some good in the world, then that's all you're going to do. If your motivation is to be, uh, have some environmental changes in life, then that's what will happen. Uh, and, and so we can't rise or societal change, then that's all that will happen. We have to uh, make sure we understand what our motivation is, what our origin is, why we're here, and what our purpose is all about. And these are cool things. And yet our origin story defines us. We have a superior origin story to Batman, Spider-Man, Bitten by a Spider, Superman, or anybody else. We have a superior origin story to all these guys. And so let's take a look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. If you have your Bibles, open them up there. It says, For you were created in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for them, for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is our origin story. This is God knitting us and putting us together and giving us a purpose long before we were ever born. We were not a mistake. We were not a coincidence. Uh, we aren't a thing of chance. We were premeditated, thought through, and carefully considered by God. Every single one of us have an origin story that God has given us. That makes us special. With every day being created for a wonderful purpose, make no mistake about it, a hero's life is the life for you when you choose to live in a relationship with God, understanding his origin. For you were created in my inmost being, he says. This means his inmost being. That means you didn't do it. You didn't create it. You didn't make it. And so you don't define it. If God created your inmost being, God is the one that defines what you were made for and why you're here. You know, I often think about this in, in, in light of my daughter. My daughter, I have, a couple, I have three daughters, and they're all great cooks, thank God. Uh, that's why I have this right here. But anyhow, uh, and they cook very well. And I have one that likes to bake quite a bit. Uh, and she excels at baking. And one of the things, there's this phrase that bakers often use or when someone's really made a really good meal. You guys know what the phrase is in the cell? She put her foot in it. That's right. He knows. It. Put my foot in it. And, and what that means is that they left their mark. They left their unique signature in the meal. That's what it means. 
And God has certainly done that with us. Doesn't mean they literally put their foot in, that'd be nasty. But they put their unique signature, their unique signature and mark in the meal. God has certainly excelled at his creation, but he's also left his unique signature and character in all the things that he has created, which is us. And that origin story rests with us. The presence of God is all over us and in us, not just made by him, but defined by him. We're defined by God and the origin story that he's given us and his purpose, and he set us on a great course. God's staff is all over us and through us, and we share in this purpose. And more significant is, is that we are set apart to do good deeds, but to honor, not just to do good deeds, rather, but to honor God and glorify his name within his presence. We are to live in him, walk in him, connect with him, have a relationship with him. To the extent of that closeness, you know, we can do amazing things. We are made in his image, he goes on to say. Uh, and then it goes on to say as well that we are wonderfully made, that we are, again, not premeditated, thought through. We are carefully considered. Carefully considered. Verse 16 says this. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to be. That means we have a remarkable destiny. This means we have a remarkable destiny. God has made an investment in your future, in my future, that hasn't been lived out or realized yet. That's how special we are. That's how special you are. That God thought about all of your days before any one of them came to be. And now he set you on a course that you could live that out if you choose to, but we have a choice. He already has in mind your life. In particular, God has, 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 has honestly decided to invest in your potential future before you've lived it out. That's kind of like when you go to the bank and you keep putting money in it, thinking that you'll spend it someday. God has invested in you and set you on your course that you could be something awesome to live out someday, but you have to choose to live out that purpose. And he already has in mind your life. In particular, when we think about this, God wants us to do some great good. And Ephesians 2.10, which I don't have up here, says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has already prepared a plan, premeditated, planned out, carefully considered, each and every one of us to do some good because of the future potential and the origin that he's put us on. Isn't that great? Isn't that incredible? And we're the greatest superheroes that could ever be if we live within the, the guidelines of Christ's uh, law and his commands. And this is the hardest part of the journey. The hardest part of the journey for the hero is getting started. That's the hardest part. They witness some incredible event. Somebody gets hurt, you know, uh, that could have been inverted. They see that. They want to do some good about that. They stumble on some secret cosmic ooze. They're hit or bombarded by gamma radiation. And now they have a choice. Because they're transformed, they're different, they're changed. Their origin story has just begun. They, it's significant, and they can see that there's something significant and different about them. But now they have to choose. What do they do with the good that they've been given? Do they choose to make it different, honor God, live for him? Do I accept the invitation to, to transform and make a difference in my life? Or do I meander through all this dull existence, never making a real impact in the world? That is the choice that we are, are given here, knowing the origin that God has given all of us. You have an origin story. And the destiny beckons, by, but that the all heroes are called to greatness, but they must choose their own fate. You get to choose your fate in your relationship with God. And true heroes are motivated by deep, inerrant desire to love God and fulfill his calling in their lives. Embrace your destiny this morning and become the hero that God wants you to be. You have an origin story. But once you understand that origin, once you understand that God has put you here for a purpose, then we need to do something about that connection. And how you get to embrace the connection you have with God is that we need to go to the secret sanctum. You know what the secret sanctum is? 
It's the back cave. It's the fortress of solitude. It's that place that you retreat to. It's Iron Man's sub basement. It's Peter Parker's messy room or your messy room. But either way, you get a secret sanctum. You have a place every hero has an inner secret sanctum, a sacred place to retreat, gather their wits, their strength, and their perspective. Every hero has that place, and you and I need that too. We need a place where we can get away from the world, where no one will bother us for a time, a place when the times are hard, school is challenging, and people are crazy, and our friends are acting, running amok and acting crazy. We can escape, regroup, get renewed with faith and hope. We all need a secret sanctum. You know, Jesus had a secret sanctum. The Bible says that in Luke 22, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had a place like this. And what's interesting about this passage is it says Jesus went out as usual. That means he had a consistent pattern of going to a secret sanctum, a quiet place, a place to be alone where he could pray, live within the presence of God, connect with God himself, and be again renewed and regenerated in his faith. We need a place like this. And I don't care what it is. In my wife's uh, definition of a secret sanctum, it's her closet. She literally goes in the closet in the morning, locks the door. She's got scriptures all around the closet, and she sits in there and she prays for about an hour. That's her secret sanctum. It could be the bathroom. It could be a walk in the park. It could be a whole lot of things, but you need a place where you can do this. Jesus had the Garden of Gethsemane, and he often retreated. It was a usual, consistent place. There was continuity in his life, walking in the presence of God. And when the challenges hit, for all any of us, he would fall on his knees, meditate, talk to God, and gain perspective. This is what we need. This is what every single one of us need in this room. No matter how young you are, you need a place where you can gain perspective. Not from the world, not from the news, not from the multiverse of social media. You know, because you're different characters on social media than you are in real life. There's a different version of you on Instagram and on Facebook and on every other social media page on TikTok than there is in your school, at home, and in your life. Am I wrong about that? We know this. The social, <laughs> you know, it's the multiverse of social media. And we're one way on social media and we're another thing somewhere else. There's another version of us somewhere else. And the true perspective of who we're supposed to be rests in our ability to connect to God and let God reveal to us who he wants us to be daily and to give us the strength to walk and live the life that he has ingrained in us inherently to live in within the purpose that he's given. That's a hard thing to do because we see the world and it's like, well, I want to live that way. And we give that version of ourselves to the world. And then in church, we give another version of ourselves in church. And God gives us perspective and strength to live out the version of ourselves that he wants us to live. This is the reason Jesus was continually in the garden, so he could have perspective. This is the place where we are aligned with God's will, no matter what he had to face or he would go through. He was reminded of his destiny and faced the world with renewed purpose. Man, isn't that what we need today? We all have times like this, when the world is jacked up, friends are jacked up, family's jacked up, mom's jacked up, dad's jacked up, they act crazy, they, we don't know what's going on in their lives, and we all need a place where we can retreat. Sometimes with life's many obstacles, we forget the resources that God has given us, but we need a bat cave, we need a secret sanctum. It's the inner sanctum uh, and reading the word of God and being devoted to prayer that brings us brings about revival in our lives. And you know, I don't know about you, but my kids going through the COVID world and, and trans, trying to navigate that place, that space, it's been challenging for them. You know, we've had some really challenging times of, of seeing therapists and, and navigating issues and 
uh, dealing with uh, suicidal thoughts, I mean, within our church and our, our children. And I don't know if you've struggled with some of those things. And there's not one answer for some of those issues. There's a lot of resources that we need to connect to to really help us. But one of the things that can help us is that we need to go and ask God to revive and help us in these situations. He reveals through faith the solution, the obstacles that we face. And many times the answer is found, not, it found simply in the phrase, not your will, but not my will rather, but your will be done. Often our issues are a matter of us trying to choose uh, to do our thing rather than to choose to do God's thing. And God in prayer, you know, the, the issue in the sacred sanctum, if you notice Jesus, he's praying for God to change an event, right? He's praying for God to change the circumstance. He's, you know, get me into another school. Get this person out of my life. Uh, I hope I don't have to do homework in this class. I hope there's not a pop quiz. Whatever the case may be, that may be what you're going through. But the real issue is Jesus is praying for the circumstance to change. But ultimately what he's hoping is that God will move his heart. The secret sanctum is there to move our hearts, not change the circumstance, but change our ability to deal with the circumstance. He says, look, not my will, but yours be done. God, if you want me to go through this circumstance, then I need you to strengthen me so I can overcome it. That's powerful. We need the secret sanctum because it's the place where we can reside in God, trust in him, gather our strength, uh, gather uh, and, and fight against the enemy and know that God will give us what we need. Not so much to change the circumstance, but to change our hearts. We need the inner sanctum, a place where we practice the presence of God faithfully and continually. I pray that we're doing that. I pray that we, we have this for ourselves, that we have a place that we can retreat to, that we're praying, connecting to God, talking to him, trying to get our hearts changed. Uh, the prayer garden downstairs is asked, uh, that the booth that's downstairs, that during this conference, that you guys would be encouraged to go down and uh, after the class and participate uh, in their prayer challenge and spend some time praying at the prayer garden. You're never too young. It's like the only, you know, it's one of the things that we don't need a, a, a vast education to do. I, I love prayer. You know, I, I can be an old person that can't read my Bible anymore, I can pray. If I can't even read, I can pray. If I can't articulate, what the scriptures are saying, I can pray. If you're, if you're too young to comprehend an exposit text, and exegete text, whatever the case may be, you can pray. This is the one thing all of us can do and be united at the foot of the cross. It's pretty amazing. And so they're asking that we go downstairs at some point throughout the day that the teens would participate uh, in the prayer garden. And I think that would be an amazing thing. But we need to understand where we come from, our origin. And then we need to understand that we connect to God through our secret sanctum. And lastly, we need our friends. We need our friends. You know, uh, we need super friends. And I'm going to explain what they are in just a second. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 9, says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other one up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep, uh, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Sooner or later, sooner or later, we realize there are forces beyond our control, too big for us, that we can't fight on our own. We saw this in, in every team. We see it with the Avengers. We see it with uh, Suicide Squad. We see it, you know, with uh, Fantastic Four or whoever. We need to team up. We need friends in our lives. Sooner or later, we realize it's much, much bigger than us, and we can't do it alone. Joining forces is the smart thing to do. And yes, there are times when we need to be alone, like that secret sanctum. We're praying to God, asking for strength, asking to persevere, asking to change. But there are other times when we need the support of others. And we need to gather those around us. And the Bible says in verse 12, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. 
And many scholars have believed that quarter three strands is our, that relationship. They will talk about a relationship with their spouse or their friendship. And then God and how God binds us together. Our friendships in God is the quarter three strands. But I want to show you something that's pretty interesting that God says. Um, in John 15, verse 14, the Bible says this, You are my friends if you do what I command. You know who your super friends are? They're the people that have the same values and convictions that you do about your relationship with God. They're going to help you to mature and grow spiritually and point you in the right direction. You can have all kinds of friends in your life, but if you don't have those types of friends, you're really lacking the support that's going to help you long term to be what you need to be. And he says, you know, in Ecclesiastes, a quarter of three strands, well, one of those strands has to be someone with commonality in terms of their relationship with God, that they believe the things that you do. They're striving for the same things you are. They're helping you to mature in your relationship with him, and they're helping you grow, and they're not going to call you to do things that are against the standard that you're trying to live. You know, I had friends growing up, and they would, often I had friends that would, they knew I was trying to live a, a faithful life, and I would try to do some weird stuff. And they'd be like, hey, man, no, that's not you. Now, they would do it, but they didn't want me to do it. And then I had friends who'd be like, yeah, man, let's all go out and do some crazy stuff, get blasted, get lit, whatever the case may be. They couldn't be my friends anymore if I was trying to be a disciple. And the bottom line is that you need people that are going to try to obey the commands of God. Surround yourself with those types of people. They're insulation to you. Now, I was studying the Bible with a, a gentleman from Iran. And um, he was in the Iran-Iraq war. Very interesting war. About, when he was about 15 years old, they, would, they called him to be an engineer in the war. He was being trained as an engineer, but one of his jobs was to deactivate, to deactivate landmines. These were explosive devices implanted in the ground that you would walk on, it would explode, and they would kill you. And so his job at 15, 16 years old was to go out into the desert and deactivate these landmines that were placed in the ground. And what he told me was, that the most devastating landmine was not the landmine that would kill you. He said that was not the most devastating one. And that wasn't the most frequent one that they planted in the ground. What they had, what they had figured out was they had a landmine that would maim uh, the person who stepped on it. And that was more effective than killing another soldier. You know why? Because when you maimed a soldier, it took seven other soldiers out of the fight to grab that person and rescue him. If you killed someone, they left him on the battlefield. But if you maimed him, seven other soldiers came out of, seven other friends came out of the battle. Okay, that's what they figured out. They could take seven or eight soldiers out of the battle fighting if they maimed someone on the battlefield rather than killed them. And then he looked at me and he said this. He said, you know what I'm learning? I'm learning that friendships in the kingdom of God are like landmines to Satan. He's got to walk through all of you to get to me. This was a gentleman that came from an Islamic background. And as he was reading the Bible and building these relationships, he looked at me and said, I am learning that friendships are like landmines to Satan. He's going to have to walk through all of you to get to me. That's why we need super friends around us. People of character that share our values, that are trying to call us higher. You know, I have so many people like this in my life. My whole staff is like this in Greater Baltimore. I love them so much. But I want to hold up uh, one gentleman and, and his wife, Dale and, and, and Thais Porter. And when we were moving from New York, we had been in New York for 20 years, and we decided to move to Greater Baltimore I looked at Dale and I said, look, I need friends around me. I'm going into a place where I really don't know the people. I need friendships. Dale was retiring from being an air traffic controller. Uh, he was in, about to enjoy retirement. And I looked at him. I said, look, I know you've established a house in Long Island. You're living your retirement. You just built a pool, got your life going here in New York and Long Island. Would you move and come with me to Maryland? 
because I need your friendship. I need someone around me that's going to call me higher, that's going to remember what, what I'm trying to accomplish in my life and, and hold me to the standard of the word. And he looked at me and said, I'm ready for a new adventure. And he and his wife picked up, left New York, and moved with us to Baltimore. We need friends like that in our life. That's such an amazing story. I, I love them so much because they were willing to do that. And, and would love us enough to, to be friends in our lives, to call us higher like that. Who do you have like that in your life? And you're young. Maybe you don't quite have those relationships yet. But we need friendships that will be with us and, and long to, 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 to carry on the standard of God with us as, as, as a partnership. We need superheroes in our life like this. And let me tell you something. Uh, I do feel that way about our whole staff. We have a great, I can't talk about all of them. Uh, certainly, I want to acknowledge that couple. They're amazing and great friends. But I do want to say this, too, as we begin to close out. You decided to do something that I admire. And I want to share with you who my favorite superhero is. I said I'd tell you that. It's you. You're my favorite superhero. You know why? Because you were brave enough to do something I was too cowardly to do. Many of you are disciples. Some of you are studying, and some of you uh, are, are just have faith in God or are, are working on that relationship. But if I could do one thing over my life, it would be to have the courage to become a Christian at your age and not have to repeat all the mistakes that I had to live through because I was too stupid, too dumb, too cowardly to see Jesus his origin story, connect with him, and live out the relationships, connect to people that had similar values. I was not afraid to do that. If I could do anything in my life, it would be to become a Christian at the age that you did. Make sure you're motivated by your origin story, your purpose. Remember what God has done. Gain strength in the inner sanctum and pick your friends carefully. They can help you excel. Or distract. It's up to you. Super friends are those who are like-minded and following the commands of God. And then when we do that, we can be marvelous in the sight of God. We can be. And God wants us to be. You know, we have two men here, two young men from the Greater Baltimore Church that are heroes of mine that God has used in incredible ways over the last few years to do some amazing things. And they're musicians. They help us to uh, just be vibrant and diverse and, and just unique in the way that we offer uh, worship in our ministry. They're teens. Uh, rather, they're college students. Now they were teens when they came to the Greater Baltimore Church. I want them to come up because they have something they're going to introduce. They just dropped a new, new song that's on YouTube. And uh, I want to play that for you in just a second. But I want to introduce Jared and Malachi Adams. So they're going to come on up. How y'all doing? Oh, man. I, uh, that lesson actually really hit me. Um, <laughs> I ain't going to lie. Um, I think about a time when I was like y'all age. I'm like, I'm like 20 now. But in that, in that team ministry, um, really just basking in friendship. Um, I think I have like so much stronger friendships now just because I took that time to build and, um, you know, get, a, uh, get those friendships on a deeper level. But we do have a video for you guys that we want to share. Um, we made it in 2020. Yeah, um, we go by the name of Adam's Wave. It uh, stands for like an uncompressed file because a wave file is uncompressed and we try to show that in our music, you know, uncompressed, uncompressed mood. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. The whole premise of it, ooh, God. The whole premise of it was um, really just basking in what, um, just being thankful for what God has given us, even in the midst of like all the crazy things that are going on, especially with 2020, the pandemic, all the stuff that was going on. But um, yeah, just being grateful and just you know taking a breather, um, just with all the things that are going on in life. So um, I don't know if Malachi wanted to share anything about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically the song is being grateful, uh, and it was funny that he talked about the secret sanctum because that's basically the idea of just 
being in a space where you can reconnect with, okay, what are my goals? What is this? What is God showing me? And yeah, this is just about being thankful. So enjoy. Amen. My superheroes, two of them encouraging. Uh, God is using their talents and abilities and their, their gifts to glorify him. And here they are with their new tune. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I've been so alive. I can't hide the pain, it's alright. I'll enjoy the day I got time. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I've been so alive. I can't hide the pain, can't hide the pain. Thankful to be alive, humble me before I feel that I have arrived. I was on a chase, was working the nine to five. Yeah. Stress on my shoulder, my time was tax returns, will say it's mine. First day of school, my new name was I. Yeah. I like the second letter on nine to five. I want the grades and all of the accolades. Scratch that, like give me a job without a pay. Match that, like give me a life full of music. All that to say, my wants have been decreasing. Finding my joy from going out and just breathing. <sighs> breathing. Looking out the wind, the sun hitting the trees. Clouds come and blow within the breeze. More life than work and worrying about tomorrow. Can't lie, learn from the sorrow. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I'm feeling so alive. I can't hide the pain, it's all right. I'll enjoy the day I got time. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I'm feeling so alive. I can't hide the pain. Can't hide the pain. Hey. Grateful to have a mouth and a mic. Can't even describe what I've had in my life, even the fact I exist. Out of the chaos and nothing and still managed to escape the abyss. Crash landed on this planet with the face of a kid. Learned manners from my parents and the basis to live. I got three siblings I've been given a gift. Might have missed the ball, but my God don't break. Don't break. Swish. Never would have guessed it. Blessing, I live another second. Some events could have led to a nexus. Low key, I'm at home chilling in my respite. Don't know my fate, but that karma my best friend. I'm feeling great that I swallow my next breath. Go in this space and I'll follow my next step. This is the best yet, life is my best friend. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I'm feeling so alive. I can't hide the pain, it's all right. I'll enjoy the day I got time. Looking up at the sky, gotta thank God I'm feeling so alive. I can't hide the pain. Again, marvelous. Do some good with the good you've been doing. To God be the glory. Amen. Thanks for coming today. I'll be here for any questions that you have. And again, once again, just thanks for being part of the class. Amen.